Hi, welcome to the Pet Healer Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lucy Vargas, and today is a great day because I have my friend, uh, Dr. Marco Maggiolo, as my first guest. And uh, Marco uh, works with us at Orchid Springs Animal Hospital. We're very lucky to have him uh, as part of our team. And he is a veterinarian uh, educated in Brazil, but he also has a master's degree in animal behavior. And you might think, well, what does the pet healer has to do with animal behavior? But in reality, um, my book also talks about longevity. Well, there's no longevity if the dogs ends up at the shelter because they have a totally preventable behavioral issue. Um, and it was just because of lack of obedience or lack of socialization. But one of the uh, foundations of a good behaved dog and um, in, in that case is definitely part of preventative medicine and it's definitely par part of the wellness of any pet. So, and that's why we have the association with you, Marco. Um, and I wanted to talk about specifically a uh, couple of things. N number one, um, what's your opinion about what I just said with the longevity of the animals? You know me, I, I try to extend the longevity. I, t I try to give them a great life. But a lot of the people um, ignore the big component of a well-lived life is uh, the emotional and the physiological and the um, uh, mental health. And um, do animals have mental health issues? What do you think? <laughs> Uh, yes. Well, good morning. Thank you very yes. much for yeah, having me Yeah, introduce yourself a little bit. I, I try, but I didn't do any justice. But No, yeah. My name is Marco Majolo. I'm originally from Brazil. Um, I'm a veterinarian graduated there with a master's degree in animal behavior in 2010. Um, and since then, so almost 10 years already, I've been working uh, just with behavior. Um, and yeah, you're right. Uh, a lot of people don't think about dog's behavior, they don't think they don't think is necessary training or um, enrich the environment or give the dog exactly what the dog needs from a behavior point of view. Um, and of course, in the long term, you start having a lot of problems, you know. Um, the relationships start getting difficult, the owners start getting frustrated, um, the owners get to the point where they're trying, telling themselves, oh, this is going to pass. When he grow up, it's going to pass, but it never passes. So it's get older and older. And even the relationship sometimes is in jeopardy because they don't know how to address that. It's like you have a kid and, you know, you need to send the kid to school. You know, you need to educate them. You need to teach them. If you just let them be, they probably learn not good stuff. Yeah. And a dog in your house, he's trying to be a dog. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, one of those things that you mentioned, you know, uh, they think that the problem would get better and oftentimes it just gets worse. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you have to intervene. And, um, and and the old adage of old dogs don't learn new tricks is, is not true. They do learn. Uh, so, I mean, a, a lot of people think, well, you know, it's been like this. Uh, the only the only option is to put them to sleep. But no, they, they do learn, right? Even oh, yeah. if you miss the puppy stages you know you can still yeah. try it will be harder probably yeah of course it's like if you start addressing this problem early mm -hmm. it's going to be easier mm -hmm. um i always say like if you're training a puppy you're training if you're training an old dog you're retraining because uh. probably there's already a lot of behaviors there but it's 100 percent possible to bring the dog back to the normal behavior um but it's, as you said, you know, people don't think about that. They think like, okay, it's going to be like this the rest of my life. And at the end, sometimes the problem escalates in a level that the owner cannot control themselves. And at the end, they just like maybe put the dog to sleep or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and that's so sad because sad. Uh, a dog's life, you know, could be 15, 16 years in some breeds. And, and to be put down at two or three, the prime of your life, just because of something that was preventable, I think it's a sin <laughs> yeah. mean, or a, you know, it's a really bad shortcoming on part of the owner. One of the things about the human animal bond you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that we derive so much uh, pleasure from the human animal bond and so much um, uh, satisfaction to having uh, the uh, pet, you know, and they understand us in a different level. Um, there's sometimes uh, the human-animal bond can be manipulated by the human part of it, 
and or by the dog part of For it, sure. but mostly by the human because we're the cognizant ones. And so, um, talking about the human animal bond will open the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is your thesis. Yes, because <laughs> tell us about your thesis. It was super interesting to hear yeah. about it. My thesis that is almost 10 years now, um, in 2010, it was regarding dog humanization. So, we work with 100 families, you know, and seeing the effects of humanization in dogs. And every time I start talking about dog humanization, the owners start, oh no, I will never be able to do that because I love my dog. I, I want to hug him. I want to hug. I want to kiss. I'm it, not saying you cannot do that. <laughs> yeah, you should do that. I have three dogs at home and I, I love them very much. You know, I have four. I lost one in 2000. 18 was horrible for me. Yeah, I was so, there. So I yeah. am a witness. He was really devastated. Yeah. So, so we love them very much and we want to hug and kiss and be with them in the couch. And there, I don't have any problems with that. You know, there's a very uh, uh, important um, study coming from another behavior. They say the dogs now, they have another job. They used to, years ago, they used to hunt with us, used to guard our house. But now they have another job. Their job is be with us, you know, is make our feel uh, we have a stressful life, have a lot of stress at work. So they, they are there to make us calm. And that's fine. That that It is a kind of job. But what we need to do, we need to be careful because we don't want to treat them 100% as a human baby because that's going to be a negative effect. So you need to start creating boundaries and limits and understanding a dog, how the dog thinks. So if you just give love, 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 but I'm not saying for you not to do it. You can do it, no problem at all, and baby them, no problem. But what kind of boundaries, what, what kind of message you're sending to your dogs? Do you have areas in your house the dog cannot go? Do your dog know how to stop when you're asking to stop? Do your dog know how to sit and stay when you're offering food? You know, does he know how to walk with you, respecting your space? Does he know what to respect the other people's space? So if you don't start putting things like that, the dog is just evolving in the point that he's dominating your house. So that love, that hug, that bed, that couch, he's seeing not as you see as a human, but as a dog, like I'm a dominant guy here. This is my. So that's when the problems start. I, I think a lot of the things that you see in our practice that I refer to you, some of my clients, is the humanization to the point where they um, they rationalize the behavior. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's doing this because he's upset that I went to the other day and I didn't look at him. Yes. And I'm like... No, <laughs> no. That, I don't think that they have all this planning and Machiavellic, you know, strategic uh, manipulation going on. It's just effect, cause and effect, right, of our behavior. Yeah. Well, sometimes I compare like dogs with human babies just to explain something, but it's not a good way to compare because dogs, they don't do logical thinking. Exactly. They don't do something now, thinking a response or a consequence in two days or tomorrow. Yeah, they live in the now. They live in the now. So as that's, we should. <laughs> that's that's the first mistake that I see from families. You know, mm -hmm. they overthink when they need to correct something. Or they overthink when they need to reward something with their dog. So it's like it's more something that you need to do for now to have a response from your dog from now. Yeah, understand my point. Um, and this is a problem because you start looking at your dog and seeing a human there. Yeah. And it's not a human. You can love, you can pet, you can baby them, but not as a human. It's a dog. So what my dog needs, how my dog see the world, you know, does he understand things like I understand? Does he understand things like a baby human will understand? No, he does not. So that's what you, what, that's when I go in and trying to tell the owners how to do that. And, and. Do you think that um, the separation anxiety uh, that we are seeing in bigger numbers nowadays, uh, dogs that have really anxious, they really have this separation anxiety if the owner's not in the room, uh, you know, do you, and a lot of the times it's the behavior of the owner. It's like, no, 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 don't touch it. Or, you know, the, beha the owner definitely contributes to the anxiety. But do you feel that humanization is... Uh, maybe a component in this epidemic of uh, anxiety in dogs? 100%. 100%. Dogs, they should be independent at home. They need to know how to deal, stay, staying by themselves, you know, when you're not there or even when you're there. So I have a little rule that I sometimes I go to people's houses and I said, uh, my dog, when I leave, he destroy my house. You know, he can, he cry, he barks. So what I always say is, 
For your dog to learn how to be by himself when you're not there, he needs to learn how to be by himself when you're there. Because 100% of the sense. time on your head, when you're there, your dog is with you. He's on your lap. Mm -hmm. He's on your bed. He's a Velcro dog. So he's <laughs> following you everywhere. So those are bad signs. Those are anxiety symptoms, you know. The moment that you detach, the moment that you need. Now in the pandemic, with people at home, I'm having it's a lot worse, of clients. Right? It's worse, Because people now are going back to work or going back to school. Mm -hmm. And the dogs are freaking out. So where is everybody? Nobody's at home. So they start uh destroying things at home they start barking they start like peeing and pooping around yeah. the house so they start and sometimes they destroy the best pillow and the best couch because an owner think that they do that because they're mad with the owners yeah. and it's not it's just because your smell is there yeah so he's just the way he's trying to find to get closer of you uh so what do you do in your house to keep that disconnection you know like you you were with me I love you very much. I'm going to pet you. You can sit on my side and watch a movie with me. It's not a problem. But look, now I need to do things. I need to study. I need to use my computer. I need to take a shower. You're going to go to your crate or you're going to go to your playpen or you go to your dog room that you should be. You should have a dog room at home. So for the moment you need to detach to go to work, the dog's not going to suffer. But now it's not. Is that what we talked before? Dogs now, they have this job to be with us. So yeah. I have a very stressful day. I'm very stressed. I got home and I stay with my dog and I just kiss him and hug him and do all that. But I'm there. I'm just transferring all this anxiety that I have to the dogs and the dogs feel that. And you're just growing little by little. That. And I'm glad that you say that because uh, one of my chapters is the, the field, the energetic field, and how there's information that transfers from the field Uh, and it's unconscious, I mean, nobody's conscious about this exchange happening, but it is information and physiological information, emotional information, all of that is in your field, your aura, like the new agers say, uh, but you, you bring that with you, and the dogs are extremely adept to reading that, to reading that information, and so we unconsciously project all these things and we're like advertising that like a billboard for the dog oh, it's yeah. like oh okay 100%. and then they bring that up so yeah, I'm glad 100%. you said that it's like the dogs the behavior is a reflex what we are Ooh, because yeah. it, it, it is because the human um, picture that they have from the world is the owner you know this is more my model you know If you are anxious and sending that anxiety to them, they're going to feel anxious. Yeah. So it, they are a reflex of what you are. And as you say, people don't, we do things without seeing we are doing. You know, mm -hmm. we send those messages. We don't realize. We are stressed. We are sad. There's an amazing study from a Canadian behaviorist. Uh, they call the modern age uh, theory for dog behavior. And uh, he said that in the lab, the modern life, we have more technology. Things are easier. Things are fast. Information is fast. But we are more stressed. Yeah. We are much more stressed than 30 years ago. 30 years ago, we didn't have internet. 30, 35 years ago, cell phones and things like that. Yeah, when you, you went out of the house, you were out in the ether. Nobody knew where exactly. you were. Exactly. So now everything is easy. So life sh is supposed to be... Should be easier, it right? Is but not. It's not. Yeah. It's much more stressful. Mm -hmm. We need to deal with all kinds of information. So we have more divorces today. That's the truth. So we are more alone in our house. This yeah. is true. So who is there? Our dog. Yeah. So we just transfer all that, all that. And that's not, it's not a coincidence that like eight out of the 10 dogs in homes now, they have separation anxiety. It's the most common behavior problem we see. It's like eight out of a 10. And separation anxiety takes you to other problems, like aggressive behaviors. Yeah. You see dogs, they become aggressive because they're possessive, because they are dominant in the house or the owner or protective or... And that's when everything starts. Yeah. So, I mean, it is our duty as a pet owner to make sure that we um, educate our dogs and that we create independent dogs. Do you think, and I often say this, I hope I'm right, but I often say to people, a dog needs a dog to fulfill himself. I mean, it doesn't mean that if you have a long dog that you cannot do, you know, provide a great life and everything. But I feel like in a deeper level, since they are pack animals, that they might need a dog. So, like, for all of you uh, listeners that have uh, just, you know, uh, one dog uh, home, you know, I hope you don't feel offended or anything, but I'm just saying, uh, even if they don't live with you, but, like, for example, activities 
like daycare my fulfill that need they do need the uh, to socialize with their own kind don't you think that or i, I mean, agree 100 percent. i just have one little um observation on that dogs are pet animals they're mm -hmm. pack animals so mm -hmm. they live in groups so if you have a bigger group in your house in theory it's better okay because yeah. they are the whole time, even when you're not there. We're not are... advocating pet hoarding, okay? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, that's why I'm going to give you a little <laughs> observation here. So it's good because they, even when you're not home, they're exercising the social skills. You know, yeah. like I said, I have three border collies at home. They're exercising their social skills. That's good. The problem is if you have one dog that is already doesn't have a good environment with you, Mm. Where he's with separation anxiety, mm. when he doesn't, where he cannot deal with the situation when you're not there. If you just introduce another individual there, it can cause more problems. Yeah. Okay. Or another example that I'm going to use a recent client. If you want to help dogs and you want to adopt dogs, that's fine. That's a, that's a good thing. And you start bringing a lot of adopted dogs in your house, two, three, four, five. Like fostering, you mean? Fostering, like, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And you don't know the previous experience of those mm -hmm. dogs. And they they will like, in a dynamic way, they were trying to create this pack and they were trying to figure out what to do by themselves. So more dogs at home, yes, is good is is better they are exercising social um, experience at home but you need to have a balanced environment exactly so if your house is not in order don't add more no if you don't know it, how to deal if your problem will magnify yeah or if you already have a dog that suffering with separation anxiety mm -hmm. su suffering with destructing things at home or crying or potty or anything or aggressive no you should take care of our environment first okay and after that you should bring other dogs <clears throat> Yeah, so I think that a lot of the times we see people uh, that just go and buy a emotional support dog in mm -hmm. uh, vest in the internet, mm -hmm. and then they put it on, slap them on them, and oh, now this is my emotional support, and they put them in situations, right? That's another thing, part of that human animal bond that where we manipulate and where we don't take into account the real feelings and the real, um, you know, benefit of the pet when we do it for our benefit, like for example, these people that just want to travel with the pet in their airplane and then just slap a emotional support or a therapy dog, which you can get in the internet, which I don't advocate for you to get, but um, you know, they, in essential, they're committing fraud because these dogs are probably not trained to be in these social situations no. and you're actually just stressing the bejesus out of them and causing them to act up, uh, you know, and so what do you think about that situation? And because I know that people ask you a lot, can you certify my dog? And yeah, uh, well, there is two different kinds of service dogs. Uh, okay. The real service dogs, the, the dogs we can call service dogs, are dogs that service. Uh, they they offer service to community. Mm -hmm. Those are service dogs, you know, like or if they're serving a service to you, like for a blind person or things like that. They are serving the community. They're just not serving you. So dogs that work in airport, dogs that work uh, in some place, they're serving the community. Mm -hmm. Emotional support dogs, they're not service dogs. <laughs> you need to remember that. And right now, there's some airports in the world, and Orlando is one of them. They're not accepting emotional support dogs anymore. Good if, for them. If you don't have not just a letter from your doctor, but a series of tests that prove that you need an emotional support dog. Okay. Okay. There's another thing. Um, you can go to Amazon and buy a harnessing service dog and put in your dog. That's not the right thing to do because your dog is not prepared for that. It's not ethical. It's sure. not ethical. From the human point of view, it's not ethical because you are using a space where a um, real service dog should be there in an airplane or in the bus or whatever you're using. Um, and from the dog's point of view, mm -hmm. your dog's not prepared for that. You're going to put a vest in your dog and take him to places. And, you know, we know preparation. We know previous previous exposure in him and, and gradually training and preparing him for big crowds or people walking around or carts or whatever you're taking them. That's bad for the dog. Yeah. You know, so you need to remember that too. Yeah, I'm... I'm very strict about the difference between service dogs and emotional support dogs. Emotional support dogs, they help you. 
not the community, so he's not a service dog. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good clarification. <laughs> but don't the people come up to you all the time to <laughs> and that's another get thing. you to sign something? Yeah, or... and that's another thing that little warning. If you want to do your dog a service dog that goes to hospitals and things like that, it's not cheap, and it's not everybody who can do that. There's, the, there's a, a certain uh, a certain temperament a... to of the dog from the standpoint of the dog. Yes. So some dogs, you know, are well prepared because they hereditary, you know, temperament is hereditary. So they are uh, what we call an earth yeah. or a metal uh, in Chinese medicine, which are dogs that are uh, calm, they're friendly, they're not overly excitable, exactly. they're just, they're born that way. So those are fertile ground to, to create. Is a, it possible to train a dog to be like that? But you, sh you need to start very early, exactly. very early, like 14 weeks old. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to start exposing this dog and doing body manipulation, the people touching that dog, and he's yeah. not stressful to anything around. A service dog should be prepared mentally for any anything happening around his environment and not be responsive or scared or anything like that. Yeah, it should like be a very confident and calm and relaxing dog. Yeah. So the way they react to new like machinery or like an exactly. electric chair or like something like that, like startling sounds, a noise, you know, noises, things like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And talking about noises and everything, there's a big common problem that we face and um, that I've seen you embrace the uh, holistic method of treating, which is noise phobia and um, you know thunderstorm and noise phobias. Um, I've seen you use, uh, definitely when you first came, well, we met like six years ago and, uh, you were all like drug, 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 drug. <laughs> now you're like drugs plus <laughs> yeah. Shen Calmer, <laughs> yeah. which is an herbal supplement that really helps with, um, uh, not just phobias. It's a tonic for the heart, but in Chinese medicine, the heart is the emperor and the heart is the seat of your behavior. So... Um, the Shen Calmer is a formula that we use a lot at our clinic, and we also use um, Silkeen, which is a uh, nutraceutical, a nutritional supplement um, that actually you told me about yeah. years ago. <laughs> so I told you about herbs, you told me about the supplement, and together we have really integrated approach to treating phobias. So from the medical and from the behavioral standpoint of view, we can actually uh, do some good. So tell us a little bit about um, your, you know, your um, perspective on that topic, on the thunderstorm phobias and um, and noise phobias, and the approach that you slightly embracing the integrated approach, which I think is more successful. But... Yeah. Well, when you when you finish college, there's all this information regarding drugs and yeah. that. Professors put in your mind. And oh, I did it for fifteen years. It, it is took and, me and it's, fifteen it's, years to get. To I'm this. not blaming them no. or anything like that. It's how you learn. You mm -hmm. were a doctor. You should use drugs, and mm -hmm. that's how you cure diseases. And okay, so I used to use a lot of like, well, let's call it real drugs yeah. <laughs> in the past, like trazodone and uh, fluoxetine yeah. and all those. Alprazolam. Alprazolam, oh, exactly. Um, when you go outside, you start working, you start opening your mind to other techniques and you start seeing how they work. And it's not secret. When I start working with you, I was not a big... Um, you was a skeptic. Come on, I say I was it. very skeptical <laughs> about even acupuncture and say like, yeah. yeah, no, this dog is sick. You need to give him a drug, you know. And uh, tell us how you changed your mind about acupuncture real quick. Yeah, yeah the double yeah. brown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, ha I have a dog. Now he's 12 years old. His name is Brown. He's a border collie. He used to do a lot of dog agility competition. And he was like eight. Mm -hmm. And his performance started going down and down. And it was like, yeah, whatever. I think he's done. You know, it's time for stopping him and retiring him. So I brought him to Dr. Vargas. She did some acupuncture things and a little bit of uh, herbs. Herbs Cheap too. performance. Cheap performance, exactly. And a year later, he won the national. So. <laughs> <laughs> So after that, he is a believer. Exactly. Now, <laughs> she convinced me, and it is right. So if I look 10 years later, my approach today, it's much different than 10 oh. years before. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you say about thunderstorms and things like that, uh, you don't want to sedate your dog. You yeah. don't want to dog make your dog not responsive to the environment because this is normally what a lot of professionals do. Like if he's responsible to something, make him scared, you give him a drug and you make him not responsive to that. So that's what a drug does. So you don't want that. You want him a little calmer in a way that you can create positive experience and teach him that that's not bad. It's okay. So there's so, a little bit of retraining. Exactly. It's retraining. It's creating positive experience. That's when Shankomer helps. That's when Zukin helps. That's when acupuncture helps, you know, because the dog's not sedated. He is awake. He's a little calmer, a little less responsive, and you can create positive experience with him. Like play times when there's storms coming, give him treats and make him calm. So yes, the, the holistic <laughs> yeah. approach at the end is much better. Yeah. Not just because you are correcting the problem with, with drugs, you're not. Yeah. You're just making him not responsive, you know. So if that happened the next day, you're going to need another drug. Yeah. And there's another problem because the our body start getting less responsive with the same amount of drugs. So we need to increase that and increase and increase it. And you they know? don't come cheap. They come with side effects. Exactly. So there's a liver and kidney side liver, effects. Kidney, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we're talking about, and, and, and please, listeners, don't think that we don't use drugs. No, 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 we no, do. no. There's a, as a time and a place and a situation for yeah. them. And oftentimes, that's how we get in uh, integrated. So yeah. we just have to do drugs for a while. Then we add things. and But our goal is never to have zombie dogs. Yeah, um, you don't want to you don't want to go straight to do exactly. this, the heavy drugs at first, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is an American problem that I see here, not just with dogs, but with people too. Yes. You know, you go straight to the, give me the most ex uh, strong drug you have you yeah. know, to use for my problem. You don't want that. You want to try to go slow. You want to try to redirect the behavior. You want to try to create positive experiences and not sedate your dog, yeah. you know. And of course, if you have, a very difficult situation, like even aggression, you know, that you can't handle your dog. If you need to use drugs, we're going to use it, but not always the first approach. And and always uh, as part of the plan, a multimodal approach, multimodal, yeah. uh, you know, options that we're going to try. And, and we play with it exactly because some of the drugs create resistance. The body, oh, yeah. you know, at one point, it don't even work. Even if you go three times a dose, it, it won't at one point on chronic use is not going to work. And so, yeah, so that's why we have to rotate and do this. But the main component that a lot of people ignore is behavior modification. So, yes, the shank calmer and the silkine and the behaviors, because some of these behavior modifications might be counterintuitive because number one issue when, when the dogs behave bad in the office or when there's a storm, the first thing people do is cuddle them. It's like, it's okay, exactly. you're a good boy. And they're like growling at us yeah. in the office. I'm like, hmm, I don't think he's being a good boy. So yeah, this is not a, a good message. You're pretty much are telling your dog, be scared and be afraid because I, I'm going to be Because I love that. I love that because I'm loving you. So it's exactly. a great thing to do it. Yeah. yeah. There is like, like if you go to that part of like talking about body manipulations, like when you bring the dog, we work in the hospital to do nails or clean ears or things like that. Most part of the dogs there don't accept that. You know, they yeah. don't think that's good. So that's another thing that I always say, like if you're doing basic obedience with your dog, what you're learning, sit down, stay, walk. That's what you're learning. It's not just about that. Yeah. You know, it's about teaching your dog to accept people touching the nails, touching the ear, touching the mouth and creating good experience with that. And it's going to be much better for your dog when he comes to see a vet, if he's OK with people doing nails, if the, you don't need three, four techs holding them, you know, and he's screaming and things like that. So all those little trains. That is so easy to do at home. Yeah. It's so easy. You know, it takes five minutes of your day. When they're babies, oh, too. Oh, my God. Five minutes of your puppy. Like, touch the nails, touch the nail clipper on the tip of the nail. It's so easy. The years, you know, can teach him to pass around cotton balls around the, the ears and cleaning. And they're going to be so much better. And you want a service dog? They're going to be calm with handling. They're going to be calm with body manipulation. If you dogs that go to hospitals, you know, and, and to visit uh, patients elderly. of cancer or elderly people and people want to hug and things like that, you're with that. 
But as I say, it's like people don't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> people don't think that. And we're so lucky to have Marco because um, our clinic uh, is proud to say that we're, we, we're low stress handling, fear-free type of clinic. And we try our best to, to do that, to not compound the problem and get a bad experience to the pets that come in. Uh, in the opposite, you know, we try to do things like positively reward them when they behave well. But we need the help of the owners. We really do to continue this and to not have bad experiences for our pets. And um, it even affects your, uh, you know, physiological parameters. If I'm examining an, a dog and it comes in in the um, temperatures 104, it, is it because it's fever? Or is it because he's yes. scared out of his mind, which some of them are. Yes. So it can affect your temperature. It can affect uh, your blood diagnostic. glucose. Or di the diagnostics are all skewed because of the behavior. So we need to have calm dogs coming in the office. And we do that. And Marco has done our training for our um, technicians and assistants. I'm very grateful to you for that because what he does in there is a little bit of, of what we've talked today, um, how to handle, how to desensitize the animals to these procedures that are going to be every day. Yep. I mean, dogs that need to go to the groomer and they need to be sedated to go to the groomer. And yep. they're like, Shih Tzus or something like that that needs grooming every four weeks. I yeah, mean, it's like it's like this. Too much. Yeah. If you take your dog to basic obedience classes, whatever you're taking, what your dog is learning, is he learning sit down, stay walk? That's it. Or he's learning body manipulation. He's learning people touching him, doing nails, doing. Because this should be part of a basic obedience training. And if it's know? not, then you're not with the right trainer. You need to go see Marco. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're trying to do with yeah. our clients there. And it's there's so much you can achieve. It's so little time. Yeah. You know. But I often say that a dog is an investment. The first year of their lives is troublesome. They get into everything. They're exploring the world. As a lot of financially is the most expensive year. Uh, they get neutered. They get pay oftentimes. Uh, all the vaccinations, everything that needs to be done in that first year. But part of that, that investment is the behavior uh, training in that year. It will give you uh, the best return on investment. It's, uh, you know, if your dog lives 15 years, you get one year of trouble and you have to put the effort and everything. But then the rest is just... <laughs> Not even that. It's six it's months. Great. Yeah. Six months It's even, six yeah. months if you start early. Yeah. And it's education is part of your, uh, your cost with your kids, right? Yeah. So it's part of your cost with your dog too. And it's not it's so expensive as people think it is. You know, yeah. it is not because the, the, the rewards you're going to have but you're going to have a return for your whole life. So, like, you're going to spend for, like, six months, you know, maybe ten months. And that's it. That's forever. And it's then forever. you have a great dog and exactly. you can take it's him forever. everywhere. People can come to your house and yep. you don't have to put him in a room and, mm -mm. you know. Yep. So, it's so wonderful to, to have a dog that is uh, well adapted to different situations. A dog that is just... Uh, balance yeah. and and my purpose uh, on this podcast is always to talk about health and balance and so one of the things that we need to do is balance our minds you know balance our minds and so behavior modification along with herbals along with good nutrition along with love along with good veterinary care those are the things that balance its dog life forever so um, one of the things that we I wanted to talk about uh, is because it's a pet peeve of yours and mine too um, is obesity in pets and mm -hmm. uh, it's part of the health of the pet. Um, tell me your impression uh, because you, you have the perspective of coming from Brazil. That's where you got educated and, um, you know. And there is an epidemic of obesity in pets and in people in this country. And so I wanted to at least, I know there's not behavior related, but it is really because it's a part of that humanization too. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes we see the obese pets belongs to obese person. Very seldom do I see a, a varying shaped person have an obese dog. Because yep. it's a, more of a um, uh, shared uh, cognition about, about the problem. So do let's just know, see. Do you know the percentage of... Obese dogs in Florida? No. 90%. 90%? 9-0. So That's dogs sad. are obese for two reasons. 
First, people don't know exactly what is a good conformation in a dog. They look to a dog and they think that round is the right. <laughs> what is not, you know? If you, you can go Google for score, body score in a dog, and you're going to see you should be seeing some ribs and you should see that belly going under a little bit. That's the perfect conformation. You should have a waist. Exactly, yeah. a little waist. Round dogs, they're overweight. Yeah. Of course, there's like more overweight and less overweight. There's a scale for that, but it is. Why the dogs are so obese like that? Because people think that feeding them is love. Exactly. We need, we go back where we start talking about. Yes, is that's, the why, love. We, we need that's why I wanted love. to finish with this. Because I, a big problem. I, maybe I'm feeling alone and that's yes. the problem in the in the modern life. We are more living alone. We and are, when you're stressed, you eat stressed. ice cream. So, so, you know, you go to the food. Yeah, and you give a treat. Yes. And you give another treat. I'm eating ice cream, so you're going to yeah, eat exactly. some of my ice cream, which is bad, and too. And chicken, but... and pork, yes. and beef, uh -huh. and fruits, and everything. And Doritos, and which they exactly. don't shouldn't and eat. And chips, and there's a football game, so I'm eating my chips with my salsa. Oh, let me give them something. Yes. So you need to be careful with that, because they are. we are like very similar, dogs and people. We're uh -huh. mammals, you know, we have a stomach, two lungs, a heart, and all that. But they metabolize completely different, you know. The same amount of food for you or the same ingredients that you use in your food. And, of course, a lot of things we eat today is bad for us. Yeah. You know, the chips and salsa and the sandwich and the fast food is bad for us. We do because we can go outside and run 10Ks and, you know, every weekend we're going to be good and go to the gym and do our exercise. But your dog is eating those things and staying at home. Yeah, or in doing, the couch. Or mm -hmm. doing that 20-minute walk, you know, that's not enough. It's not enough. So... You're having behavior problems. You're having physical problems too. So yeah, be because diabetes, heart disease is exactly. the same. The same predispositions that obesity causes in humans, it causes on animals. Yep. And so we do have, we are mammals. And so we will have consequences for that love that you're giving. And there is a study from Purina years ago. And to me is the critical study where they did the, um, the Labrador's, And they fed them uh, restricted calories. And then the other one, same exact genetic material, uh, Labradors, uh, they fed them whatever they wanted to do, kept them on non-ideal body weight. The ideal body weight, they live two years longer. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's ridiculous. So yeah. if you love your pet, you tell me, I love them so much, I have to give them food. You don't love no. your pet. No. It's like for food, it's like a lot of times less is more. Yes. You know? It's like, have a good food, buy a good kibble, you know, choose a good brand, a good food that has right amount of protein, fat, and all that. Feed him like twice a day and give treats like in the middle of that. But remember, treats like, I don't know, people are listening to the podcast. It's like, yeah. it's like it's little, it's very, tiny. it's tiny. It's supposed to be tiny. It's a taste. It's, it's not a, nutritionally, it's, it's, it's not the nutritionally no, no. Uh, acceptable way of, of feeding your dog. It's not going to uh, account for all the calories. Yeah, it's like, supposed to be just a taste. Five millimeters, it's enough, just size of a bite. <laughs> yeah. You know, not like those like big bones that like, I've seen people feeding dogs and there's the food there, they put dry food, wet food, and the big treat inside the, yeah. the bowl. So this is like, it's, it's too, too much. It's too much. It's, too it's much. not balanced. Even for little dogs, you think about the size of their stomach. They can't stand. Yes, they can. But yes. just think about the size of their and stomach. And the size of the stomach is, you. we are telepathically connected, I'm telling you, because the size of our stomach is our fist, right? Yeah. So think about a little chihuahua's paw. Exactly. It's the size of that. Yeah. So exactly. It's not the size of your stomach. You don't need a them. lot of food. <laughs> a lot of times I go to clients and I see the big bowl with food there the whole day. And that's another thing, just to finish. Um, yeah. One thing that I ask people to do is like, don't leave food there the whole day. Don't leave leftovers there. Make that food something valuable. Exactly. The food is the most valuable thing, the most valuable motivator you can have in your house. It's food, you know. So look at your package. See how many grams or cups per day you should give. Like if it is a cup, it's half a cup, nothing more. It's going to be little. You look at your dog. So this is my dog will hold the whole, uh, going to eat the whole day. Yes. And it's enough because there's a lot of people studying foods and they know that in that amount, there's just what your dog needs. Give that to him, remove the bowl, 
let him be a little hungry for the next meal. He's going to look to that meal. He's going to look at you. It's like, oh, this is my food provider. I live because of that person. You know, they don't understand the food comes from a bag, that comes from a grocery <laughs> store, that comes from a website. They or think whatever. we're the greatest hunters in the exactly. world. Exactly. <laughs> so you are the food provider. You were the one that offering food. So you are much more important in that pack now because Ooh. without you, they die because they don't eat. So if, if, if they just pass by and the food is there in the boat the whole day, what valuable you have on that? And I'm not even saying what you're losing because that food is like open in the air there. You're losing smell. You're losing all the attractive Bacteria grows in there Bacteria grows and all that. There's humidity there. I see people putting water in the food and Oof. the food stayed there for two, three, four hours. Oof. So that water, that humidity will create bacteria and you can bring bugs around and sit there and flies and things like that. There's a lot of problems. So food is like it's meal time. You sit, you eat. Until next time. If you don't eat it, too sad. Remove it and let him be hungry a little bit because next time he's going to look at you. So this is the guy who hunts for me. <laughs> okay? If I don't eat, he's going to let me hungry. Yeah. That's how you like. See, we're talking about physical problems, but also behavior problems. Behavior problems. Exactly. Yeah. You're like, this is my this is my master. This is, this is the hunter. So I need to respect him. You know? So yeah. that's it. Yeah, and I think as a, a prevailing problem in our societies, everybody wants to be friends with everybody and nobody wants to assume a leadership sometimes. And, mm -hmm. and there's got to be leadership in our families and they have to be leadership with our pets, you know, and I think that's a great uh, thought to close our uh, podcast. I'm so happy that you share with us uh, your expertise and I'm so proud to call you my friend for six years and my colleague at Orchid Springs and uh, I hope that our listeners gain some insight and uh, when you go back home um, and you go look at your pets uh, think about what is in their best interest. Sometimes we just think what me, 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 uh, a little bit selfish, a little bit um, out of balance And so we need to think what's good for me, what's good for them, so oftentimes is the best solution. So thank you so much for listening to the Pet Healer Podcast. We are getting, um, you know, other guests lined up for our upcoming episodes. So please uh, stay put, put and um, follow us on all the different platforms. And this is going to be on our YouTube um channel for the Orchid Springs Animal Hospital so uh, you'll get to see us and hear us. Thank you so much.